This evening we continue on in the first part of our series in the Psalms. We'll be looking at Psalm 4. So if you would turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 4. Hear now God's Word. To the choir master with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Salah. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. So far the reading from God's word this evening. Well, the book of Psalms, they can be very refreshing and very comforting to us as readers of them because they so often reflect kind of the stages of relationship that we may go through uh, with the Lord when we face hardship or when we face uh, sin or when we face uh, times of joy even. Uh, They can be so refreshing, these Psalms, because they're easy for us to relate to them. And so much of David's troubles in this psalm seem to be uh, reflected in our own experiences as well. Here David turns to God for help and and he he spends time working through much of what we would work through when we learn to trust in the Lord or when we learn to turn to the Lord, when we learn to express our needs to the Lord in a way that honors and glorifies Him. And the end result for David in this psalm, of course, is peace like a A baby who falls asleep on on his mother's shoulder. That is the picture that David has. He lies down and sleeps in peace because the Lord makes him dwell in safety. What we want to do this evening is is work through this psalm and, and see how David, first of all, comes to terms with whom he is addressing. To whom does David pray? And how and why does he pray to him? So it speaks of David as the righteous. It speaks of God, actually, as the God of David's righteousness, uh, but David being righteous in in the first verse. Then in verses 2 through 5, we're going to see why David needs to call out to this God of his righteousness. Why would he bother? And we're going to see that it's because David is rejected. David is facing hardship in his life. And then the last three verses, verses 6 through 8, we're going to See how God in His grace restores David. How God in His grace gives him peace so that he can lie down and sleep. And so we're going to see how David is restored in verses 6 through 8. So David as righteous, David as rejected, and David as restored as we work our way uh, through this psalm. Well, first look at the superscript. Sometimes the superscript can help us because it talks to us about the historical context within which David wrote this psalm, or whoever the psalmist was wrote this psalm here. Uh, It doesn't give us any help in terms of understanding the historical context of the psalm, but we do see that that it was, however privately uh, prayed at first, later on to be used in the corporate worship of God's people. We have uh, the psalm ascribed or written to the choir master, the one who led the people of Israel in song at the temple. Uh, He uh, was to do it, it says here, with stringed instruments in uh, the superscript. And so the historical context of the psalm may not be known, uh, but we do see it to be applied in a corporate setting. And so we can generically apply it to ourselves even uh, centuries uh, later. And so here David, in verse 1, begins with a plea to the Lord, Answer me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. He asks God to answer his question, to answer his prayer. And assumed in that plea that David makes here in the beginning of his psalm, 
uh, is that God really doesn't owe him an answer. If God owed him an answer, he wouldn't have to ask the Lord to hear his plea. He would just simply uh, lay it before, but, uh, before the Lord. But David begins from a position of inferiority. He, he knows who he is in comparison to the Lord. And so he comes to the Lord asking in his circumstance, there is only one who can help me, and he is God. There is only one who can deliver me, and he is God. And David asks it of him. He doesn't presume on the grace of God. And when David pleads to the Lord, when he asks him for help, he calls him uh, a very interesting name. He calls him the God of his righteousness. It assumes, or it, it shows us anyways, that uh, David does not assume his righteousness to be coming from himself, uh, even though uh, he is comfortable to come into the presence of the Lord, he recognizes that this is the God of his righteousness, the God from whom my righteousness comes. That's another way of saying what David said, says here in this psalm. Uh, to use this phrase, of course, there must be two things that are true of David. Uh, in the first place, uh, David must know that he himself is not righteous. There is one who gives him righteousness. It is the God of heaven and earth. So David, in using this phrase, shows us that he understands that he by nature is not righteous. And second of all, it shows us that David understands that the righteousness that he has is given to him uh, by God. So David understands that he is not righteous himself, but that God gave this, the righteousness that he possesses uh, to him. That's because if David thought that he was righteous, of course, everything would be fine. If David thought he was righteous on his own, he wouldn't need to call out to God. He wouldn't need God for any, anything. Uh, if he doesn't know God gave him his righteousness, why would he turn to God in the first place? That's why David must understand, first of all, that he is not righteous, and second of all, that God is the one who gives it to him. If, if David uh, did not get his uh, or if David was righteous, he wouldn't need God. If God didn't give him righteousness, why would he turn to God in the first place? But when David says this phrase, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness, he is indicating that he knows. He knows David. David knows he is stained with sin and that God has given him righteousness. Righteousness meaning, uh, meaning right standing or, or right living. David uh, uh, understands this to have been given to him by God. Now that, of course, uh, causes us to ask ourselves, is that the perspective that we have when it comes to our righteousness? Do we know that God, through Christ, is the God of our righteousness? Or are we bringing our own righteousnesses to God? Do we come to God and present Him our good works? Or do we recognize that it is the good work of Christ that makes us pure, that washes us from the guilt of our sin. Of course, related to this is that people who know nothing of God uh, must understand, first of all, that they need Him. They must understand, first of all, that they are sinful and in need of forgiveness. Uh, these days, you see it a lot on, on uh, TV interviews where, where people know they're interviewing somebody who is I'm betraying my cynical perspective, but they, they know they're, they're interviewing somebody who's a conservative uh, in their moral convictions. And you have uh, the, I don't know, Pierce Morgan comes to my mind. He, he asks the question, are you saying that homosexuals are going to go to hell? What's the assumption behind that question that the interviewer asks? The presumption behind that interviewer's question is, God could not possibly send this person to hell because overall, he's a pretty good guy. He's not much different from anybody else in, in how he lives except for uh, this one question of his homosexuality. And are you saying that he is going to go to hell in eternity for that? And when you watch those interviews, sometimes you see pastors and uh, even prominent pastors in our own denomination or, or politicians or or we ourselves, we, we fail to say what is needed in those moments. We, we fail to point out to the people uh, who are interviewing us uh, that we are not okay uh, by nature. 
we don't stand before God for what we do well, as if that were even possible. But you stand before God for your sin. There is a need for God's righteousness to be given to you. If you don't know it, you'll never turn to God and ask Him for help. So, the question really uh, is ridiculous. Are you saying a homosexual will go to hell? Uh, he's a decent guy in all other ways, or she's a decent gal in all other ways. It's like a murderer going into a courtroom. Maybe it's a murderer who has committed one act of, of passion. He lost his temper and, and he regrets it. And he is, we'll say, a hundred years old for easy math. He comes before the judge and the judge says to him, did you murder this man? And he turns to the judge and he says, well, yeah, but uh, the other 36,499 days, I was actually pretty decent. I was, I was a good guy. What would the judge say to him? He would turn to this man and say, you're not standing before me because of the other 36,499 days of your life. You're standing before me for that one moment when you murdered. You're standing before me because you are guilty. You're not standing before me because you are good on all these other days. And so it is misunderstood in our world that people stand before God uh, guilty because of their sin. They stand before God. They need Christ's salvation not because of the good things they have done, as if that would be possible, but because of all the sins that they have committed. And so when, uh, when you're sitting there looking at that TV screen, shaking your head at the pastor or the politician who may be failing to give that answer, we have to ask ourselves, do we understand it uh, in our homes? Do the people that we talk to about God understand that they stand before Him guilty? Or are they unaware of their doom? In those interviews, don't you wish that one time, uh, and I know men have done it, but they would just have the courage to say, if a homosexual doesn't repent of sin and put his faith in Christ, he will go to hell, just like every other sinner. But let me tell you about the forgiveness that is available to them in Christ. Let me tell you of how they can be relieved of the burden of their sin. Let me tell you of how they can be free from that which they carry, that they would stand before God the same way that I, as a sinner, stand before God. The problem, of course, isn't with God. The problem is with man's unyielding heart. And so, as God's ambassadors, we are to help people understand uh, their sinful condition so that they might seek forgiveness from God. It is our responsibility in our homes with our, our little children. It is our responsib responsibility uh, to those that we meet on the way who speak to us about God. It is our responsibility uh, to the folks that we have not even seen, people in the Middle East who are ravaging that part of the world. Uh, we can think of it for them in prayer, that, we would set, that, they, that someone would set before them uh, the guilt that they are incurring, that they would flee to God for help, that they with David would say, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. David, of course, understands this. David understands that he is a sinner, that he receives his righteousness from God. I don't know if you remember, but a couple of weeks ago when we looked at Psalm 3, we saw the historical setting of David's confidence in that which God would do for him. He, he spoke in, in Psalm 3, verse 3 and following, that God is a shield about him and that God answered him. And, he, and David's speaking in the past tense. Now, that's true here also. Uh, in the first verse of this psalm. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Now, David's past, again, shapes his confidence. 
But added to that confidence uh, this time is a recognition by David or an explicit statement by David of God's grace in hearing his prayer when he says, Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Of course, uh, prayer is one of the ways that God communicates His grace to His people. We speak of the ordinary ways that God does that. We, we speak of the reading of the Word. We speak of the sacraments. But prayer also is one of the ordinary ways that, that God communicates His grace to His people. And, and David knows it. He says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, when I call to you and hear my prayer. And so God, uh, David is asking for God's grace to be communicated to him. And so it is in prayer. When we ask according to God's will and His grace, He gives us that which we ask for. And all this uh, forms the foundation uh, for David's call. David cries out to God, why? Because he understands God is the God of his righteousness. God is the, the one who made his dead soul alive again. Do you think that David's circumstances are more complicated than making a dead human soul and, and giving it breath again? I mean, what God did in David's life in becoming his God, the God of his righteousness is what is described for us in Ezekiel 37. When you have the valley of dry bones and, and, and God calls the, the prophet to prophesy to these dry bones and, and the prophet speaks God's word. A big pile of Bones, no life in them at all. And God brings those bones together and He gives them ligaments and sinews and He covers them with flesh and, 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 and puts skin over it and He breathes into those bodies life. It's a picture of what happens to our soul. It's a picture of what happens to us when God becomes the God of our righteousness. And so David calls to Him in confidence because he knows He is the one who is able to work all things for his own glory. And there's a reason, of course, that David calls out to this God. In verses 2 through 5, we see that. It's because David has been rejected. Why does David need an answer from, from God? Because of man. Uh, there are men who are around David, and they oppress him, and they disgrace him. Sometimes when we uh, read the Bible, don't we make the mistake of, of taking the, the patriarchs or, or taking David and, and viewing them as kind of supermen. Uh, these people didn't struggle the same way we did. Uh, sometimes when you, you think of the Apostle Paul and, and you hear the word that, words that he, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes down, and, and we forget that he was a, a man of flesh and blood just like we are. He's the, the same guy who cries out in despair about his sin, who identifies himself as the, the chief of sinners. And David is, is the same way. He's not void of, of the valleys of life. David has experienced hardship, tremendous hardship. We sometimes just think of him as, as King David in Jerusalem. But we forget he didn't get to Jerusalem until he was much older, in, into his 30s. Up until that point, his life was actually quite trying. He was the youngest of, of Jesse's eight sons, and we know that he is scorned by his brothers. We know it from the account of Samuel coming to anoint one of Jesse's sons. He lets Jesse know to bring his sons in 1 Samuel 16. And here they come one at a time to see if they're going to be the anointed king to replace Saul. And one after another, Samuel says, this is not the one, this is not the one, until all Samuel's boys pass before the sight of uh, all of Jesse's sons passed before the sight of Samuel. And what does Samuel say? Don't you have any more sons? Oh yeah, I have one more. David, he's, he's, in, he's with the sheep. We didn't, we didn't bring him here. Or later on when David goes to see what's happening at the army uh, of Israel, when Goliath is challenging God's people, he's sent by his father. And he comes and he hears what Goliath is saying and he says, who is this Philistine that he should mock the living God? And what does his oldest brother say? What did you do? Why aren't you with the sheep? I know why you came here. You just came here for the show. He was despised even in his own family. Then after he kills Goliath, of course, there's a measure of success in his life. But 
even during that time. Uh, he is chased around by his father-in-law, trying to kill him twice with a spear, chasing him around in the wilderness so much so that, he, that David doesn't feel he can leave his family in Israel. His family is in danger. Then once, he, once Saul and his sons are killed on, on the mountain, David becomes king, but only king of Judah. The rest of Israel doesn't accept him. And there is uh, years of civil war, six or seven years of, of civil war between Judah and Israel. Once he becomes king in, in Jerusalem, his, his son Absalom chases him out of Jerusalem and seeks to, uh, to kill him. In his old age, his fourth son Adonijah tries to usurp his desires for Solomon resting on the throne. One of these moments are what David has in mind. One of these moments are when David is saying, how long will my honor be turned into shame? How long uh, will men love vain words and seek after lies? And this is uh, one of the moments, one of the valleys in David's life. And in that valley, he is reliant on the God of his righteousness. And he turns to him uh, for help. He observes about the men who are oppressing him. Uh, several things. First of all, that they love vain words, and second, that they seek after lies. They love the vanity of uh, thinking themselves above the anointed king of Israel. They seek after those who will flatter them in their vanity. And then they speak lies, lies which oppose God. Anything that opposes God is always a lie. And the Son of God, also known as the Word, who came into the world, he is self-described as the way, the truth, and the light. By contrast, Satan is described in John chapter 8 as the father of lies, the one uh, after whom all other liars get their marching orders, the one whom all other liars imitate. But when David speaks to these men, these men who are vain and, and who seek after lies, he warns them, beginning in verse 3, he warns them that God has set some people apart. We see this, of course, throughout the narrative of Scripture. In Exodus chapter 6, for example, when Moses is commanded to lead Israel out of Egypt, he is sent to Pharaoh. And how much strength does Israel have when Moses goes to them? Does, does Moses go from a position of strength and say, Guess what, Pharaoh? We have you in a corner now. Let us go. No. Moses comes in a position of complete weakness. Here he is, the leader of, of what? Of a nation of slaves. Does that strike you as a particularly well-organized group of people in a position of great military strength? They are in great weakness. And they, uh, the request that Moses made would be laughable, except for one thing. The people whose freedom he is commanding, ordering, are the people of God. They are set apart by God for his service. And so the Lord hears his people. They, he is near to his people. And he shows it to his people. What happens when Israel leaves Egypt? There's a pillar, a pillar of fire, uh, by night, a pillar of cloud by day. What does that pillar say? I'm with you. And then later on, David builds this temple in, in Jerusalem. Or Solomon builds it, actually. David makes the plan. Solomon builds it. And when Solomon dedicates the temple, the priests go in to do their work. And what happens? The glory of God settles on the temple in such a way that the, the priests can't even go inside to do their work. Uh, the glory of God rests on uh, the temple. And then you have the most powerful manifestation. Emmanuel, the Messiah, God with us. The Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. He dwells among His people. He is not a God who is far away. And so he hears David. He hears us when we call. We are not deists. We do not believe that God 
set the world in motion and, and cranked it up and sent it on its way, and sitting back just observing everything in heaven. God has set apart a people, the godly, for himself. And so the Lord hears when David cries to him. The Lord hears when we cry to him in our distress. And so then David cautions his enemies not to, to sin in their anger. We see that same command repeated in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, this is a warning by David to his enemies not to resent God in anger, but that they are to consider the special purpose that God has for his people in silence as they rest. Of course, we have to understand anger. Uh, anger becomes unrighteous when we take offense for things that relate to us. Anger is righteous uh, when it, it takes offense at a violation of the honor and glory of God. That is, when, that is why when Jesus cast out the money changers in the temple, his anger was righteous because he was offended uh, at the honor of his God. But anger becomes unrighteous when it has to do with our pride or our convenience or our sensibilities. It's, e it's easy uh, to demonstrate unrighteous anger. Uh, you only have to say, for, for most dads, anyways, my experience, you only have to say spilled milk. And there you have an example of unrighteous anger. We become frustrated because we have become inconvenienced. We, we are frustrated because we don't like the mess that has been caused. There is no sin that we're responding to. It simply is a matter of convenience for us. And instead, uh, David calls these enemies of his to offer right sacrifices, to put their trust in God. Where it says right sacrifices, it, it literally, literally says in the Hebrew, to sacrifice sacrifices of righteousness. Who is our righteousness again? God is our righteousness. So when we offer up our good deeds, they flow out of an understanding of the redemption purchased for us. If we seek to offer our sacrifices, meaning exclusive of God, all of them are vain and untruthful lies. So David exhorts even his enemies uh, to understand, to live righteously before God, not to take offense at their own inconveniences, but be angry only uh, in violation of God's honor. So we learn about righteous indignation in this passage. We learn that there is a time to have right, righteous anger when God's honor is violated. But I wonder how many of us are thinking here of circumstances where we are justified in our anger towards others. How many of us have, have taken this now and said, well, I'm glad he talked about this because I am angry at this person and, and fortunately for me it's righteous anger. I think it's righteous anger. What about your sin? Are you indignant about your sin? Does your sin anger you? Do you long to have an angry response to your own sin? Or do you just ask God for forgiveness? God, forgive me, I did it again. Does your prayer ever include, Lord God, make me hate what I have done. Make me hate it when I dishonor your name. This is what David's enemies have done. They have dishonored the Lord's anointed. They have turned his honor into shame. And they're angry at God because he is inconvenient to them. Don't let that be you. I pray that that would not be me. It is good for us to pray to the Lord God that he would teach us to hate our sin. But then we see at the end of the psalm that David is restored in verses 6 through 8. Uh, some, some of us perhaps even in this room, uh, when we come to despair, we forget about the Lord of our righteousness. We forget about the God who is over all our circumstances. And in all the darkness, we may ask ourselves, where will our help 
come from? In this psalm, uh, the people ask, who will show us some good? Then you have that response by David, uh, that cry to God that he would lift the light of his face and shine it upon us. It's like, it's a picture, it's a, it's a different part of literature, the psalms are. They're poetic in nature. And so there is description in them that we wouldn't read necessarily in the epistles. But here you have the picture of, of God in all his glory, having his face shine down on his people. Doesn't it bring to mind a, a proud mom or dad who, who sees that little one take off on that two-wheeler for the first time? Or uh, see that little one uh, uh, learn how to sing that song? Or stand up and, and re rehearse that, that verse from Scripture? Even in older children, that, that parent who hears of the promotion of a son who has worked hard in, in his work, the, the favor of the father, he is, he is so pleased with his son. This is the picture that is being communicated here. May the light of your face, uh, may lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. What's David asking for? Lord God, show us your favor. Show us your approval. And God is tender towards his children. It's a very tender picture that is written here in, in the sixth verse of our psalm. And so David continues on, recognizing God's grace and his tender mercies towards his people. And he recognizes uh, that which God can give to us is greater than anything else we could ever imagine uh, in this world. When we come uh, to trust the Lord, there is more joy than ever. Perhaps some of you remember that. When you first came to recognize that Christ had delivered you from the guilt of your sin. There is a greater joy in that than anything else. Better than any material thing. That's what, that da what David is saying. It's greater uh, than any uh, plentiful harvest and wine uh, that could be imagined in his day. And to put it into a contemporary context, uh, the salvation that we have from the Lord is greater even than winning the Mega Million Lottery. $300 million is nothing compared to the joy that you have from when uh, Christ becomes uh, your Lord. And so the enthusiasm and the joy that belongs to us, it should be remembered by us. That's why in Matthew 11, Christ can say to his disciples uh, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. In Christ, God's yoke is easy and his burden is light because he bears our burden for us. That guilt that was yours, that was weighing you down all your days, is gone. And it's gone forever. And do you know where you left it? It's nailed to the cross of Christ. That's where you left it. And so your joy is better than anything else that you can imagine in this world. And that's why David can end this psalm. Verse 8. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. David begins his psalm disturbed, crying out to the God of his righteousness, the, the foundation of his prayer being, this is the God who gave me life. And he says, O God who gave me life, look at my situation. Let me describe my circumstances for you. And now that I've described my circumstances for you, I know that none of this matters because you are the joy of my life. Because you are the one who makes me dwell in safety. Therefore, I can lie down and sleep in peace. Do you experience that kind of peace? Many of us, especially in this day of go, go, worry, worry, scurry, scurry, we lie down at bedtime. And sleep flees from our hearts. Sleep Sleep flees from us because of the, the cares and concerns that we have from day to day. Some of us may, may sleep. We may doze off into a fitful sleep. But when you have surrendered all to the God of your righteousness in every circumstance, 
there is one thing that is sure. It is contentment and peace. Whatever takes place around us, whatever takes place around David in this psalm, takes place around the God of our righteousness. This God of our righteousness has set us apart, and it is He who will make us dwell in safety with Him in glory into eternity. Let's pray together.